Amnesty International, Wikipedia article audio. Amnesty International is a London-based non-governmental organization focused on human rights. The organization claims to have over 7 million members and supporters around the world. The stated objective of the organization is to conduct research and generate action to prevent and end abuses of human rights, and to demand justice for those whose rights have been violated. History 1960s Amnesty International was founded in London in 1961, following the publication of the article The Forgotten Prisoners in the Observer on May 28, 1961, by the lawyer Peter Benenson. Amnesty draws attention to human rights abuses and campaigns for compliance with international laws and standards. It works to mobilize public opinion to put pressure on governments that let abuse take place. Amnesty considers capital punishment to be the ultimate, irreversible denial of human rights. The organization was awarded the 1977 Nobel Peace Prize for its campaign against torture, and the United Nations Prize in the field of human rights in 1978. In the field of international human rights organizations, Amnesty has the third longest history, after the International Federation for Human Rights and broadest name recognition, and is believed by many to set standards for the movement as a whole. Amnesty International was founded in London in July 1961 by English labor lawyer Peter Benenson. According to his own account, he was travelling in the London Underground on November 19, 1960 when he read that two Portuguese students from Coimbra had been sentenced to seven years of imprisonment in Portugal for allegedly having drunk a toast to liberty. Researchers have never traced the alleged newspaper article in question. In 1960, Portugal was ruled by the Estado Novo government of António de Oliveira Salazar. The government was authoritarian in nature and strongly anti-communist, suppressing enemies of the state as anti-Portuguese. In his significant newspaper article The Forgotten Prisoners, Benenson later described his reaction as follows. Open your newspaper any day of the week and you will find a story from somewhere of someone being imprisoned, tortured, or executed because his opinions or religion are unacceptable to his government. The newspaper reader feels a sickening sense of impotence. Yet if these feelings of disgust could be united into common action, something effective could be done. Benenson worked with friend Eric Baker. Baker was a member of the Religious Society of Friends who had been involved in funding the British campaign for nuclear disarmament as well as becoming head of Quaker Peace and Social Witness, and in his memoirs Benenson described him as a partner in the launching of the project. In consultation with other writers, academics, and lawyers and, in particular, Alec Diggs, they wrote via Louis Blom Cooper to David Astor, editor of the Observer newspaper, who, on May 28, 1961, published Benenson's article The Forgotten Prisoners. The article brought the reader's attention to those imprisoned, tortured, or executed because his opinions or religion are unacceptable to his government or, put another way, to violations, by governments of Articles 18 and 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The article described these violations occurring, on a global scale, in the context of restrictions to press freedom, to political oppositions, to timely public trial before impartial courts, and to asylum. It marked the launch of Appeal for Amnesty, 1961 the aim of which was to mobilize public opinion, quickly and widely, in defense of these individuals, whom Benenson named prisoners of conscience. 
the appeal for amnesty was reprinted by a large number of international newspapers. In the same year, Benenson had a book published, Persecution 1961, which detailed the cases of nine prisoners of conscience investigated and compiled by Benenson and Baker. In July 1961 the leadership had decided that the appeal would form the basis of a permanent organization, Amnesty, with the first meeting taking place in London. Benenson ensured that all three major political parties were represented, enlisting members of Parliament from the Labour Party, the Conservative Party, and the Liberal Party. On September 30, 1962, it was officially named Amnesty International. Between the Appeal for Amnesty, 1961 and September 1962 the organization had been known simply as Amnesty. 1970s What started as a short appeal soon became a permanent international movement working to protect those imprisoned for nonviolent expression of their views and to secure worldwide recognition of Articles 18 and 19 of the UDHR. From the very beginning, Research and campaigning were present in Amnesty International's work. A library was established for information about prisoners of conscience and a network of local groups, called Threes Groups, was started. Each group worked on behalf of three prisoners, one from each of the then three main ideological regions of the world, communist, capitalist, and developing. By the mid-1960s Amnesty International's global presence was growing and an international secretariat and international executive committee were established to manage Amnesty International's national organizations, called sections, which had appeared in several countries. The international movement was starting to agree on its core principles and techniques. For example, the issue of whether or not to adopt prisoners who had advocated violence, like Nelson Mandela, brought unanimous agreement that it could not give the name of prisoner of conscience to such prisoners. Aside from the work of the library and groups, Amnesty International's activities were expanding to helping prisoners' families, sending observers to trials, making representations to governments, and finding asylum or overseas employment for prisoners. Its activity and influence were also increasing within intergovernmental organizations, it would be awarded consultative status by the United Nations, the Council of Europe and UNESCO before the decade ended. 1980s In 1967 Peter Benenson resigned after an independent inquiry did not support his claims that AI had been infiltrated by British agents. Later he claimed that the Central Intelligence Agency had become involved in amnesty. Leading Amnesty International in the 1970s were key figures Sean McBride and Martin Ennels. While continuing to work for prisoners of conscience, Amnesty International's purview widened to include fair trial and opposition to long detention without trial, and especially to the torture of prisoners. Amnesty International believed that the reasons underlying torture of prisoners by governments, were either to acquire and obtain information or to quell opposition by the use of terror, or both. Also of concern was the export of more sophisticated torture methods, equipment and teaching by the superpowers to client states, for example by the United States through some activities of the CIA. Amnesty International drew together reports from countries where torture allegations seemed most persistent and organized an international conference on torture. It sought to influence public opinion to put pressure on national governments by organizing a campaign for the abolition of torture which ran for several years. 1990s Amnesty International's membership increased from 15,000 in 1969 to 200,000 by 1979. 
This growth in resources enabled an expansion of its program, outside of the prison walls, to include work on disappearances, the death penalty and the rights of refugees. A new technique, the urgent action, aimed at mobilizing the membership into action rapidly was pioneered. The first was issued on March 19, 1973, on behalf of Luiz Basilio Rossi, a Brazilian academic, arrested for political reasons. 2000s At the intergovernmental level Amnesty International pressed for application of the UN standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners and of existing humanitarian conventions to secure ratifications of the two UN Covenants on Human Rights in 1976, and was instrumental in obtaining additional instruments and provisions forbidding its practice. Consultative status was granted at the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights in 1972. 2010s In 1976 Amnesty's British section started a series of fundraising events that came to be known as the Secret Policeman's Ball series. They were staged in London initially as comedy galas featuring what the Daily Telegraph called the creme de la creme of the British comedy world including members of comedy troupe Monty Python, and later expanded to also include performances by leading rock musicians. The series was created and developed by Monty Python alumnus John Cleese and entertainment industry executive Martin Lewis working closely with Amnesty staff members Peter Luff and subsequently with Peter Walker. Cleese, Lewis, and Luff worked together on the first two shows. Cleese, Lewis, and Walker worked together on the 1979 and 1981 shows the first to carry what the Daily Telegraph described as the rather brilliantly rechristened Secret Policeman's Ball title. The organization was awarded the 1977 Nobel Peace Prize for its campaign against torture and the United Nations Prize in the field of human rights in 1978. Structure by 1980 Amnesty International was drawing more criticism from governments. The USSR alleged that Amnesty International conducted espionage, the Moroccan government denounced it as a defender of lawbreakers, and the Argentinian government banned Amnesty International's 1983 annual report. Throughout the 1980s, Amnesty International continued to campaign against torture and on behalf of prisoners of conscience. New issues emerged, including extrajudicial killings, military, security and police transfers, political killings, and disappearances. Towards the end of the decade, the growing number of refugees worldwide was a very visible area of Amnesty International's concern. While many of the world's refugees of the time had been displaced by war and famine, in adherence to its mandate, Amnesty International concentrated on those forced to flee because of the human rights violations it was seeking to prevent. It argued that rather than focusing on new restrictions on entry for asylum seekers, governments were to address the human rights violations which were forcing people into exile. Apart from a second campaign on torture during the first half of the decade, two major musical events occurred, designed to increase awareness of amnesty and of human rights during the mid to late 1980s. The 1986 Conspiracy of Hope Tour, which played five concerts in the U.S., and culminated in a day-long show, featuring some 30-odd acts at Giants Stadium and the 1988 Human Rights Now World Tour Human Rights Now, which was timed to coincide with the 40th anniversary of the United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, played a series of concerts on five continents over six weeks. Both tours featured some of the most famous musicians and bands of the day. Throughout the 1990s, 
Amnesty continued to grow, to a membership of over 7 million in over 150 countries and territories, led by Senegalese Secretary General Pierre Sain. Amnesty continued to work on a wide range of issues and world events. For example, South African groups joined in 1992 and hosted a visit by Pierre Sain to meet with the apartheid government to press for an investigation into allegations of police abuse, an end to arms sales to the African Great Lakes region and the abolition of the death penalty. In particular, Amnesty International brought attention to violations committed on specific groups, including refugees, racial-slash-ethnic-slash-religious minorities, women, and those executed or on death row. The death penalty report when the state kills and the human rights are women's rights campaign were key actions for the latter two issues. Artists for Amnesty During the 1990s, Amnesty International was forced to react to human rights violations occurring in the context of a proliferation of armed conflict in Angola, East Timor, the Persian Gulf, Rwanda, and the former Yugoslavia. Amnesty International took no position on whether to support or oppose external military interventions in these armed conflicts. It did not reject the use of force, even lethal force or ask those engaged to lay down their arms. Instead, it questioned the motives behind external intervention and selectivity of international action in relation to the strategic interests of those who sent troops. It argued that action should be taken to prevent human rights problems from becoming human rights catastrophes and that both intervention and inaction represented a failure of the international community. Charitable Status In 1995, when AI wanted to promote how Shell Oil Company was involved with the execution of an environmental and human rights activist Ken Sarawiva in Nigeria, it was stopped. Newspapers and advertising companies refused to run AI's ads because Shell Oil was a customer of theirs as well. Shell's main argument was that it was drilling oil in a country that already violated human rights and had no way to enforce human rights policies. To combat the buzz that AI was trying to create, it immediately publicized how Shell was helping to improve overall life in Nigeria. Salil Shetty, the director of Amnesty, said, Social media re-energizes the idea of the global citizen. James M. Russell notes how the drive for profit from private media sources conflicts with the stories that AI wants to be heard. Amnesty International Sections, 2005, Algeria, Argentina, Australia, Austria, Belgium, Belgium, Benin, Bermuda, Canada, Canada, Chile, Côte d'Ivoire, Denmark, Faroe Islands, Finland, France, Germany, Greece, Guyana, Hong Kong, Iceland, Ireland, Israel, Italy, Japan, Korea, Luxembourg, Mauritius, Mexico, Morocco, Nepal, Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway, Peru, Philippines, Poland, Portugal, Puerto Rico, Senegal, Sierra Leone, Slovenia, Spain, Sweden, Switzerland, Taiwan, Togo, Tunisia, United Kingdom, United States of America, Uruguay, Venezuela, Amnesty International Structures, 2005, Belarus, Bolivia, Burkina Faso, Croatia, Curaçao, Czech Republic, Gambia, Hungary, Malaysia, Mali, Moldova, Mongolia, Pakistan, Paraguay, Slovakia, South Africa, Thailand, Turkey, Ukraine, Zambia, Zimbabwe, 
International Board Chairpersons, Sean McBride, 1965-74, Dirk Borner, 1974-17, Thomas Hammabug, 1977-79, Jose Zalakat, 1979-82, Saria Wickramazing He, 1982-85, Wolfgang Heinz, 1985-96, Franca Ciuto, 1986-89, Peter Duffy, 1989-91, Annette Fisher, 1991-92, Ross Daniels, 1993-19, Susan Waltz, 1996-98, Mahmoud Ben Ramdhain. 1999-2000, Kalmo Kuanachain, 2001-02, Paul Hoffman, 2003-04, Jap Jacobson, 2005, Hannah Roberts, 2005-06, Lillian Goncalves Hokong Yu, 2006-07, Peter Pack, 2007-11, Pietro Anton Ioli, 2011-13, and Nicole Bisk, 2013-present, Secretaries General. Amnesty International was proactive in pushing for recognition of the universality of human rights. The campaign Get Up, Sign Up marked 50 years of the UDHR. 13 million pledges were collected in support and the Dickel Music Concert was held in Paris on December 10, 1998. At the intergovernmental level, Amnesty International argued in favor of creating a United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights and an International Criminal Court. After his arrest in London in 1998 by the Metropolitan Police, Amnesty International became involved in the legal battle of Senator Augusto Pinochet, former Chilean dictator, who sought to avoid extradition to Spain to face charges. Lord Hoffman had an indirect connection with Amnesty International, and this led to an important test for the appearance of bias in legal proceedings in UK law. There was a suit against the decision to release Senator Pinochet taken by the then British Home Secretary Mr Jack Straw, before that decision had actually been taken, in an attempt to prevent the release of Senator Pinochet. The English High Court refused the application, and Senator Pinochet was released and returned to Chile. A is for Auschwitz, at the Death House Door, Blood Diamond, Border Town, Catch a Fire, in Prison My Whole Life, In Vitas, Lord of War, Rendition, The Constant Gardener, Tibet, Beyond Fear, Trouble the Water, Twelve Years a Slave, Tiango Unchained, The Help. After 2000, Amnesty International's agenda turned to the challenges arising from globalization and the reaction to the September 11, 2001 attacks in the United States. The issue of globalization provoked a major shift in Amnesty International policy, as the scope of its work was widened to include economic, social and cultural rights, an area that it had declined to work on in the past. Amnesty International felt this shift was important, not just to give credence to its principle of the indivisibility of rights, but because of what it saw as the growing power of companies and the undermining of many nation-states as a result of globalization. Principles Objectives Country Focus Funding in the aftermath of September 11 attacks, the new Amnesty International Secretary-General, Irene Khan, reported that a senior government official had said to Amnesty International delegates, Your role collapsed with the collapse of the Twin Towers in New York. In the years following the attacks, 
some believe that the gains made by human rights organizations over previous decades had possibly been eroded. Amnesty International argued that human rights were the basis for the security of all, not a barrier to it. Criticism came directly from the Bush administration and the Washington Post, when Khan, in 2005, likened the U.S. government's detention facility at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, to a Soviet gulag. Women's, Children's, Minorities, and Indigenous Rights, Ending Torture, Abolition of the Death Penalty, Rights of Refugees, Rights of Prisoners of Conscience, Protection of Human Dignity During the first half of the new decade, Amnesty International turned its attention to violence against women, controls on the world arms trade, concerns surrounding the effectiveness of the UN, and ending torture. With its membership close to 2 million by 2005, Amnesty continued to work for prisoners of conscience. In 2007, AI's executive committee decided to support access to abortion within reasonable gestational limits, for women in cases of rape, incest, or violence, or where the pregnancy jeopardizes a mother's life or health. Amnesty International reported, concerning the Iraq War, on March 17, 2008, that despite claims the security situation in Iraq has improved in recent months, the human rights situation is disastrous, after the start of the war five years earlier in 2003. In 2009 Amnesty International accused Israel and the Palestinian Hamas movement of committing war crimes during Israel's January offensive in Gaza, called Operation Cast Lead, that resulted in the deaths of more than 1,400 Palestinians and 13 Israelis. The 117-page Amnesty report charged Israeli forces with killing hundreds of civilians and wanton destruction of thousands of homes. Amnesty found evidence of Israeli soldiers using Palestinian civilians as human shields. A subsequent United Nations fact-finding mission on the Gaza conflict was carried out. Amnesty stated that its findings were consistent with those of Amnesty's own field investigation, and called on the UN to act promptly to implement the mission's recommendations. In February 2010, Amnesty suspended Jita Sagal, its gender unit head, after she criticized Amnesty for its links with Mozambique, director of Cage Prisoners. She said it was a gross error of judgment to work with Britain's most famous supporter of the Taliban. Amnesty responded that Sagal was not suspended for raising these issues internally, speaks about his own views, not Amnesty International's. Among those who spoke up for Sagal were Salman Rushdie, Member of Parliament Dennis Max Hain, Joan Smith, Christopher Hitchens, Martin Bright, Melanie Phillips, and Nick Cohen. In February 2011, Amnesty requested that Swiss authorities start a criminal investigation of former U.S. President George W. Bush and arrest him. Criticism and Controversies In July 2011, Amnesty International celebrated its 50 years with an animated short film directed by Carlos Lasano, produced by Elan Motion Art and Dream Life Studio, with music by Academy Award winner Hans Zimmer and nominee Lorne Balfe. The film shows that the fight for humanity is not yet over. In August 2012, Amnesty International's chief executive in India sought an impartial investigation, led by the United Nations, to render justice to those affected by war crimes in Sri Lanka. On August 18, 2014, in the wake of demonstrations sparked by people protesting the fatal police shooting of Michael Brown, an unarmed 18-year-old man, 
and subsequent acquittal of Darren Wilson, the officer who shot him, Amnesty International sent a 13-person contingent of human rights activists to seek meetings with officials as well as to train local activists in nonviolent protest methods. This was the first time that the organization has deployed such a team to the United States. In a press release, AIUSA Director Stephen W. Hawkins said, the U.S. cannot continue to allow those obligated and duty-bound to protect to become those who their community fears most. Cage Controversy Pay Controversy Awards and Honors In June 2016, Amnesty International has called on the United Nations General Assembly to immediately suspend Saudi Arabia from the UN Human Rights Council. Richard Bennett, head of Amnesty's UN office, said, The credibility of the UN Human Rights Council is at stake. Since joining the Council, Saudi Arabia's dire human rights record at home has continued to deteriorate and the coalition it leads has unlawfully killed and injured thousands of civilians in the conflict in Yemen. In December 2016, Amnesty International revealed that Voiceless Victims, a fake non-profit organization which claims to raise awareness for migrant workers who are victims of human rights abuses in Qatar, had been trying to spy on their staff. Amnesty International published its annual report for the year 2016-2017 on February 21, 2017. Secretary-General Salal Shetty's opening statement in the report highlighted many ongoing international abuses as well as emerging threats. Shetty drew attention, among many issues, to the Syrian civil war, the use of chemical weapons in the war in Darfur, outgoing United States President Barack Obama's expansion of drone warfare and the successful 2016 presidential election campaign of Obama's successor Donald Trump, which, as Shetty put it, was characterized by poisonous discourse in which he frequently made deeply divisive statements marked by misogyny and xenophobia, and pledged to roll back established civil liberties and introduce policies which would be profoundly inimical to human rights. In his opening summary, Shetty stated that the world in 2016 became a darker and more unstable place. 2016 In February, Amnesty International launches its annual report of human rights around the world titled The State of the World's Human Rights. It warns from the consequences of us vs them speech which divided human beings into two camps. It says that this speech enhances a global pushback against human rights and makes the world more divided and more dangerous. It states that in 2016, governments turned a blind eye to war crimes and passed laws that violate free expression. Recently. Trump signed an executive order in an attempt to prevent refugees from seeking resettlement in the United States. Elsewhere, China, Egypt, Ethiopia, India, Iran, Thailand and Turkey carried out massive crackdowns, while authorities in other countries continued to implement security measures represent an infringement on rights. National Sections 2017 In July 2017 Turkish police detained 10 human rights activists during a workshop on digital security at a hotel near Istanbul. Eight people, including Edil Sayer, Amnesty International Director in Turkey, as well as German Peter Stüdner and Swede Ali Garavi, were arrested. Two others were detained but released pending trial. They were accused of aiding armed terror organizations in alleged communications with suspects linked to Kurdish and left-wing militants, 
as well as the movement led by US-based Muslim cleric Fethullah Gülen. Amnesty International is largely made up of voluntary members, but retains a small number of paid professionals. In countries in which Amnesty International has a strong presence, members are organized as sections. Sections coordinate basic Amnesty International activities normally with a significant number of members, some of whom will form into groups, and a professional staff. Each have a board of directors. In 2005 there were 52 sections worldwide. Structures are aspiring sections. They also coordinate basic activities but have a smaller membership and a limited staff. In countries where no section or structure exists, people can become international members. Two other organizational models exist, international networks, which promote specific themes or have a specific identity, and affiliated groups, which do the same work as section groups but in isolation. The organizations outlined above are represented by the International Council which is led by the IC chairperson. Members of sections and structures have the right to appoint one or more representatives to the council according to the size of their membership. The IC may invite representatives from international networks and other individuals to meetings but only representatives from sections and structures have voting rights. The function of the IC is to appoint and hold accountable internal governing bodies and to determine the direction of the movement. The IC convenes every two years. The International Board, led by the International Board Chairperson, consists of eight members and the International Treasurer. It is elected by and accountable to, the IC, and meets at least two times during any one year and in practice meets at least four times a year. The role of the International Board is to take decisions on behalf of Amnesty International, implement the strategy laid out by the IC, and ensure compliance with the organization's statutes. The International Secretariat is responsible for the conduct and daily affairs of Amnesty International under direction from the International Board. It is run by approximately 500 professional staff members and is headed by a Secretary General. The Secretariat operates several work programs, international law and organizations, research, campaigns, mobilization, and communications. Its offices have been located in London since its establishment in the mid-1960s. Amnesty International, through its Artists for Amnesty program has also endorsed various cultural media works for what its leadership often consider accurate or educational treatments of real-world topics that fall within the range of Amnesty's concern. In the UK Amnesty International has two principal arms, Amnesty International UK and Amnesty International Charity LTD. Both are UK-based organisations but only the latter is a charity. The core principle of Amnesty International is a focus on prisoners of conscience, those persons imprisoned or prevented from expressing any opinion other than violence. Along with this commitment to opposing repression of freedom of expression, Amnesty International's founding principles included non-intervention on political questions, a robust commitment to gathering facts about the various cases and promoting human rights. One key issue in the principles is in regards to those individuals who may advocate or tacitly support resorting to violence in struggles against repression. AI does not judge whether recourse to violence is justified or not. However, AI does not oppose the political use of violence in itself since the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, in its preamble, foresees situations in which people could be compelled to have recourse, as a last resort, to rebellion against tyranny and oppression.
If a prisoner is serving a sentence imposed, after a fair trial, for activities involving violence, AI will not ask the government to release the prisoner. Notes AI neither supports nor condemns the resort to violence by political opposition groups in itself, just as AI neither supports nor condemns a government policy of using military force in fighting against armed opposition movements. However, AI supports minimum humane standards that should be respected by governments and armed opposition groups alike. When an opposition group tortures or kills its captives, takes hostages, or commits deliberate and arbitrary killings, AI condemns these abuses. Amnesty International opposes capital punishment in all cases, regardless of the crime committed, the circumstances surrounding the individual or the method of execution. In pursuit of this vision, Amnesty International's mission is to undertake research and action focused on preventing and ending grave abuses of the rights to physical and mental integrity, freedom of conscience and expression, and freedom from discrimination, within the context of its work to promote all human rights. Amnesty International primarily targets governments, but also reports on non-governmental bodies and private individuals. There are six key areas which Amnesty deals with. Some specific aims are to abolish the death penalty and extrajudicial executions and disappearances, ensure prison conditions meet international human rights standards, ensure prompt and fair trial for all political prisoners, ensure free education to all children worldwide, decriminalize abortion, fight impunity from systems of justice, and the recruitment and use of child soldiers, free all prisoners of conscience, promote economic, social and cultural rights for marginalized communities, protect human rights defenders, promote religious tolerance, protect LGBT rights, stop torture and ill treatment, stop unlawful killings in armed conflict uphold the rights of refugees, migrants, and asylum seekers, and protect human dignity. To further these aims, Amnesty International has developed several techniques to publicize information and mobilize public opinion. The organization considers as one of its strengths the publication of impartial and accurate reports. Reports are researched by interviewing victims and officials, observing trials, working with local human rights activists, and monitoring the media. It aims to issue timely press releases and publishes information in newsletters and on websites. It also sends official missions to countries to make courteous but insistent inquiries. Campaigns to mobilize public opinion can take the form of individual, country, or thematic campaigns. Many techniques are deployed, such as direct appeals, media and publicity work, and public demonstrations. Often, fundraising is integrated with campaigning. In situations which require immediate attention, Amnesty International calls on existing urgent action networks or crisis response networks. For all other matters, it calls on its membership. It considers the large size of its human resources to be another of its key strengths. The role of Amnesty International has an immense impact on getting citizens on board with focusing on human rights issues. These groups influence countries and governments to give their people justice with pressure and in human resources. An example of Amnesty International's work, which began in the 1960s, is writing letters to free imprisoned people that were put there for nonviolent expressions. The group now has power, attends sessions, and became a source of information for the UN. The increase in participation of non governmental organizations changes how we live today. Felix Dodds states in a recent document, 
in 1972 there were 39 democratic countries in the world, by 2002, there were 139. This shows that non-governmental organizations make enormous leaps within a short period of time for human rights. Amnesty reports disproportionately on relatively more democratic and open countries, arguing that its intention is not to produce a range of reports which statistically represents the world's human rights abuses, but rather to apply the pressure of public opinion to encourage improvements. The demonstration effect of the behavior of both key Western governments and major non-Western states is an important factor, as one former Amnesty Secretary General pointed out, for many countries and a large number of people, the United States is a model, and according to one Amnesty manager, large countries in small countries. In addition, with the end of the Cold War, Amnesty felt that a greater emphasis on human rights in the North was needed to improve its credibility with its Southern critics by demonstrating its willingness to report on human rights issues in a truly global manner. According to one academic study, as a result of these considerations the frequency of Amnesty's reports is influenced by a number of factors, besides the frequency and severity of human rights abuses. For example, Amnesty reports significantly more on more economically powerful states, and on countries which receive U.S. military aid, on the basis that this Western complicity in abuses increases the likelihood of public pressure being able to make a difference. In addition, around 1993-94, Amnesty consciously developed its media relations, producing fewer background reports and more press releases, to increase the impact of its reports. Press releases are partly driven by news coverage, to use existing news coverage as leverage to discuss Amnesty's human rights concerns. This increases Amnesty's focus on the countries the media is more interested in. In 2012, Christian Benedict, Amnesty UK's campaign manager whose main focus is Syria, listed several countries as regimes who abuse people's basic universal rights, Burma, Iran, Israel, North Korea, and Sudan. By including Israel in that short list Mr. Benedict was reprimanded. His opinion was garnered solely from his own visits with no other objective sources. Amnesty's country focus is similar to that of some other comparable NGOs, notably Human Rights Watch. Between 1991 and 2000, Amnesty and HRW shared 8 of 10 countries in their top 10. In addition, Six of the ten countries most reported on by Human Rights Watch in the 1990s also made the Economist's and Newsweek's most covered lists during that time. Amnesty International is financed largely by fees and donations from its worldwide membership. It says that it does not accept donations from governments or governmental organizations. According to the AI website, these personal and unaffiliated donations allow AI to maintain full independence from any and all governments, political ideologies, economic interests, or religions. We neither seek nor accept any funds for human rights research from governments or political parties and we accept support only from businesses that have been carefully vetted. By way of ethical fundraising leading to donations from individuals, we are able to stand firm and unwavering in our defense of universal and indivisible human rights. However, AI did receive grants from the UK Department for International Development, the European Commission, the United States State Department and other governments. AI was also funded by the Rockefeller Foundation. However, this funds are only used in support of its human rights education work. Criticism of Amnesty International includes claims of excessive pay for management, under protection of overseas staff, 
associating with organizations with a dubious record on human rights protection, selection bias, ideological slash foreign policy bias against either non-Western countries or Western-supported countries, and criticism of Amnesty's policies relating to abortion. Governments and their supporters have criticised Amnesty's criticism of their policies, including those of Australia, Czech Republic, China, Democratic Republic of the Congo, India, Iran, Israel, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Vietnam, Russia, and the United States, for what they assert is one-sided reporting or a failure to treat threats to security as a mitigating factor. The actions of these governments, and of other governments critical of Amnesty International, have been the subject of human rights concerns voiced by Amnesty. The Sudan Vision Daily, a daily newspaper in Sudan, compared Amnesty to the National Endowment for Democracy, saying it is, in essence, a British intelligence organization which is a part of the government decision-making system. Amnesty International suspended Jida Sagal, its gender unit head, after she criticized Amnesty for its high-profile associations with Mozambique, the director of CAGE Prisoners, representing men in extrajudicial detention. To be appearing on platforms with Britain's most famous supporter of the Taliban, Beg, whom we treat as a human rights defender, is a gross error of judgment she said. Sagal argued that by associating with Beg and Cage prisoners, Amnesty was risking its reputation on human rights. As a former Guantanamo detainee, it was legitimate to hear his experiences, but as a supporter of the Taliban it was absolutely wrong to legitimize him as a partner, Sagal said. She said she repeatedly brought the matter up with Amnesty for two years, to no avail. A few hours after the article was published, Sagal was suspended from her position. Amnesty's senior director of law and policy, Whitney Brown, later said Sagal raised concerns about Beg and Cage prisoners to her personally for the first time a few days before sharing them with the Sunday Times. Sagal issued a statement saying she felt that Amnesty was risking its reputation by associating with and thereby politically legitimizing Beg, because Cage Prisoners actively promotes Islamic right ideas and individuals. She said the issue was not about Beg's freedom of opinion, nor about his right to propound his views, he already exercises these rights fully as he should. The issue is, the importance of the human rights movement maintaining an objective distance from groups and ideas that are committed to systematic discrimination and fundamentally undermine the universality of human rights. The controversy prompted responses by politicians, the writer Salman Rushdie, and journalist Christopher Hitchens, among others who criticized Amnesty's association with Beg. After her suspension and the controversy, Sagal was interviewed by numerous media and attracted international supporters. She was interviewed on National Public Radio on February 27, where she discussed the activities of cage prisoners and why she deemed it inappropriate for Amnesty to associate with Beg. She said that cage prisoners Asim Qureshi spoke supporting global jihad at a His Beauty Tara rally. She noted that a bestseller at Beg's bookshop was a book by Abdullah Azam, a mentor of Osama bin Laden and a founder of the terrorist organization lashkar e -Taiba. In a separate interview for the Indian Daily News and Analysis, Sagal said that, as Qureshi affirmed Beg's support for global jihad on a BBC World Service program, these things could have been stated in his introduction with Amnesty. She said that Beg's bookshop had published The Army of Medina, which she characterized as a jihad manual by Diren Barot. In February 2011, 
newspaper stories in the UK revealed that Irene Khan had received a payment of £533,103 from Amnesty International following her resignation from the organisation on December 31, 2009 a fact pointed to from Amnesty's records for the 2009-2010 financial year. The sum paid to her was in excess of four times her annual salary of £132,490. The Deputy Secretary General, Kate Gilmore, who also resigned in December 2009, received an ex grazia payment of £320,000. Peter Pack, the chairman of Amnesty's International Executive Committee, initially stated on February 19, 2011, the payments to outgoing Secretary General Irene Khan shown in the accounts of AILTD for the year ending March 31, 2010 include payments made as part of a confidential agreement between AILTD and Irene Khan and that it is a term of this agreement that no further comment on it will be made by either party. The payment and AI's initial response to its leakage to the press led to considerable outcry. Philip Davies, the Conservative MP for Shipley, decried the payment, telling the Daily Express, I am sure people making donations to Amnesty, in the belief they are alleviating poverty, never dreamed they were subsidizing a fat cat payout. This will disillusion many benefactors. On February 21 Peter Pack issued a further statement, in which he said that the payment was a unique situation that was in the best interest of Amnesty's work and that there would be no repetition of it. He stated that the new Secretary-General, with the full support of the IEC, has initiated a process to review our employment policies and procedures to ensure that such a situation does not happen again. Pack also stated that Amnesty was fully committed to applying all the resources that we receive from our millions of supporters to the fight for human rights. On February 25, Pack issued a letter to Amnesty members and staff. In summary, it states that the IEC in 2008 had decided not to prolong Khan's contract for a third term. In the following months, IEC discovered that due to British employment law, it had to choose between the three options of either offering Khan a third term, discontinuing her post and, in their judgment, risking legal consequences, or signing a confidential agreement and issuing a pay compensation. In 1984 Amnesty International received the Four Freedom Award for the Freedom of Speech in 1977, Amnesty International was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for having contributed to securing the ground for freedom, for justice, and thereby also for peace in the world.